Hi. Okay. Here we are. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so, uh, Professor Yamamura invited me to address the art history class, and I appreciate that very much. It's one of the few subjects I did very well, <laughs> actually, when I was in art school. But um, uh, Professor Yamamura, in, back in, 19, in 2016, got in touch with me after she had visited my studio and um, asked me to meet her in Grand Central Station uh, because she was uh, upset about the situation there and the homeless and how they were being treated. And we met and we toured the station. I told her a little bit about the history of how in the waiting rooms they used to provide showers and things for passengers and people could rest there. And, uh, <clears throat> but um, since then it's become uh, more, much more commercially uh, involved in uh, restaurants and exhibitions and temporary things. Uh, not our exhibitions, but exhibitions of like, I don't know, sports cars or things. Um, so we had that meeting and then uh, as a result of her concern about the treatment of the homeless, this, is, this, this exhibition, this wonderful exhibition came to fruition at the Kingsbridge Art Museum. Kingsbridge, I'm sorry, that's the Bronx. <laughs> Kingsboro, Kingsboro Art Museum. Um, so the subject of the exhibition is on homeless or the homeless. So um, the homelessness is, you know, is a, is a problem that we all face in either long-term or short-term. Uh, some of us are homeless um, and there's both immediate, there are very immediate uh, problems involved in uh, helping work with that. Um, there's the immediate shortages of housing with support services. That's very important because it, according to my reading, that's what really works with uh, helping to solve the problem of homelessness. That is not just to provide shelter, but to provide shelter with social services, um, psychological services, uh, uh, financial services, uh, as well as fiscal services, uh, medical, clothing, eating, etc. cetera. Uh, when that's done, it seems to work. So that's, let's say just one, that's just one aspect of <clears throat> homelessness, uh, which would be the immediate problem, or what I'm thinking of it, the immediate problem, although the immediate problem has been in existence for many, many years. If you visit the exhibition, there's a very early work, uh, I think it was from the 70s or 80s, <laughs> I'm not sure which. Um, the long-term problem, which is the problem for all of us, is the way in which um, humanity is treating the earth. And um, it's come to a point where we really have to change that because uh, the earth is responding and I think winning. Uh, so at some point, uh, the earth may just kick us out and try to heal on its own. Uh, once it's destroyed by humankind, it will just revert and slowly recover. So that would be uh, a homeless, an extreme homeless uh, situation for all of us. So uh, for the exhibition, um, I decided I wanted to address one of the issues that the homeless face and what that is the uh, their feeling of being invisible. They sit on the sidewalk or in a place and people just ignore them. And I'm talking about the homeless outside of shelters, outside of uh, uh, areas where they're helped physically to have shelter. And 
one of the problems in Grand Central was that most of the seating now is blocked off for anyone except those people who are waiting for trains or have a reservation or a restaurant. Um, and the homeless have very little area to stop and just warm up or even sit down. It's kind of like the right to rest. If you have nothing and you can't even sit down without being harassed and moved, it becomes a problem. And it's a problem that many people ignore. So the priority seating uh, project that I work, worked on uh, is, um, starts with uh, this top image over here, uh, which is a, a ready-made. Uh, in other words, it's not a design that I made. It's a, it's a label used in Ontario, Canada, where the law says that you have to give up your seat to uh, people with disabilities, the elderly or pregnant women. So what I've done with that in this uh, second image here is I've digitally uh, manipulated a little bit and added the homeless to that list of priority seating. Um, there happens to be, there happened to be another um, problem with that which is uh, in the original, this word disabilities was misspelled. <laughs> so people pick that up and I had to redesign it in terms of that. So it's digitally altered. Um, the idea is it's a participatory work in which visitors to the gallery can pick up a, one of these labels and they're, they're, they have a temporary uh, adhesive on the back, which means if you use it and put it down somewhere, it can just be lifted right off. It doesn't do any damage to anything. Uh, however, that act of doing that, which we'll discuss a little bit later, is, um, could be seen as against the law. So on the back of the uh, label, we have um, the sanitation department's regulations and consequences if someone uh, stops you from doing this. Uh, and we'll get to all that later, which introduces a, a element of surveillance in the performative aspect of the work. Um, but first, uh, as this is an art history class, I wanted to just touch on a little um, wouldn't say recent, but since 19, the early 1900s, a little bit of art history. And that the first thing would be the concept of the ready-made. Um, now that was, these are two works in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art, which feature, uh, Marce, this is Marcel Duchamp's uh, Bicycle Wheel and, and the Snow Shovel, two separate works. Uh, the Bicycle Wheel was the first ready-made placed in the context of an art, an art context. Um, and it's, uh, as you can see, simply taking a bicycle wheel, putting it together with a stool, and the uh, fork part of the bicycle, and it can be spun around. Now there are interesting anecdotes about this because people, some people at one point were so upset that an artist came in and he actually stole the piece, took it out into the MoMA garden, threw it over the wall to a, a co-conspirator, and they kidnapped it for a while. Uh, of course it was returned, <laughs> but, it's just created a lot of uh, controversy at that time. The other piece with the snow shovel is simply a snow shovel, which is exactly as it's made, bought and just put into the art context. It does have one uh, additional thing, which is uh, the title of the piece, which is written at the bottom of the snow shovel itself um, in French, uh, which translates to an, in anticipation of a broken arm. So these are two early 1915, 1914 uh, works by Marcel Duchamp. Now I wanna show you a later work. <coughs> um, which is the Mona Lisa. Uh, it's actually just a postcard that he bought and added the mustache and L-H-O-O-Q is the title of the work. 
And uh, I'll leave it up to you to research the meaning and why he, he did that. But I was recently reading a, a uh, review on the Times of an of a exhibition, and there was an interesting term used in that. I don't know if it's been used before. Uh, and it was uh, talking about the work of the, the exhibition the critic was reviewing. He uh, turned the coin, coined the term uh, an assisted ready-made. So the label that I created, I would say, is an assisted ready-made. The ready-made aspect of it is the label itself, just taken from Ontario. And the assistance uh, to it is the manipulation of it and digitally to create, uh, to include the homeless. This is a work by Joseph Boyce, one of many, many works. Uh, and um, it's called Sled, and it's built about, around the myth that he created about himself, which is, uh, we're going to hear a phone ring, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Maybe that'll help. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, it'll continue. Okay. Um, okay, where were we? Okay, it's a sled. And God, we are all inundated by these calls. This is part of the performance work we're doing right now. Okay, pack, okay. I can't turn it off. <laughs> That's fun. Okay. Okay, I'll get back to you. Thank you. Go away. Okay. Oh my God, this is a long one, isn't it? It's crazy. <laughs> I am. I really apologize for this. I should have uh, anticipated that and disconnected the, the landline. It's just constantly these calls. Okay. <coughs> I'm going to wait for this. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Given that, the split by Joseph Boyce refers to a myth that he created about himself. Uh, in the Second World War, when he was 19 years old, he joined the Luftwaffe and he was shot down in the Crimea and he was found about a day or so after, I mean, he said, buried in the snow and nomadic Tartars found him and they wrapped him, they covered his body in animal fat, wrapped him in felt and put him on a sled and put, brought him to recover. And the light is for navigation. So this is one example of uh, a ready-made. Uh, however, it refers to this myth that uh, Boyce has made up about himself and inspires a lot of his early work. Uh, this is a performance work by Joseph Boyce. Uh, it's called How to Explain Pictures to a Dead Hair, in which he, for an hour or two, I believe, in, uh, explains his pictures to this dead hair. Um, so what I'm, another example of not a ready-made, but a work that may be seen as a ready-made, and it's Jasper John's uh, Valentine L. It's called uh, Bronze Sculpture, I believe. I don't know the exact title of it. Um, I'm sorry, it's called Painted Bronze. So at the time, this was a very popular beer, uh, Ballantine beer, and he cast these two cans in, in bronze and then painted, this is a painting of the original label. Uh, one aspect of it that's very, very interesting to me is one of the cans is open and one of the cans is closed. You can see a little triangle here, which is the result of uh, a can opener 
we used to call it church key. Um, and it's also, we can't tell because we can't pick up these cans individually. Um, we could only pick up the whole bronze sculpture, but it's thought that the can that's open is empty and the can that's closed is solid bronze. Finally, in terms of uh, objects, this is an exhibition again at MoMA and it includes, it's by the work of uh, Andy Warhol, his Mao painting, his Elvis painting, and more interestingly to me are the Brillo boxes. There's an essay by uh, Arthur Danto, a philosopher and art historian, um, called, uh, it's an essay called After the End of Art. And his thesis is that art starts with the invention of perspective in the 13, 1400s and ends with the Brillo boxes. And what he's saying is that art as an object that we look at in terms of its composition, its color, its technique, its, uh, well, everything that has to go into making the object. At this point, um, it meets the reality. When I was a kid working in a supermarket, I used to take when these boxes would come off the truck, exactly looking exactly like this, I, one of my jobs was to bring them in and put them into storage before they went into the market. So I recommend you think about that. That is um, now speaking of when I was a kid, I was in art school studying. This is on the left is uh, Milton Resnick's painting called Crown. It's a large, large, large painting. It's uh, six by eight feet at least, a little bit larger than that, I believe. And on the right is William de Kooning. Now, the reason I put these things here is, uh, you know, how do we get from painting, abstract expressionism, uh, to performance? And what are the kinds of, is there any similarity, anything that goes on that may have a relationship? And the only thing I could think of is gesture. Now in studying with Resnick, he would say that the painting is a map of the scars and marks acquired in the process of making the painting. So here on the right, you can see de Kooning working on one of his women uh, and this gesture. So gesture might be the thing that we would think about in terms of a continuous, a continuation of an older, idea brought anew, uh, which gives credence to uh, Dante's idea that after the Brillo boxes, there was the end of art and everything else refers to things that went on before. Uh, I'm going to now talk to you about a little bit about uh, some of my work. These two pieces are from a video called Breathe. Now artists, um, at the time this was made a little bit before, were uh, responding to the art market uh, and the gallery system. When I was in art school, the system was that you would go to art school, you'd document your work, you'd bring it around to galleries. The gallery owners would decide whether or not it was something they wanted to exhibit, uh, oftentimes based on the possibility of selling. And uh, if so, you would get into the gallery, you'd have exhibitions. Museums would then come and curators would come and visit the gallery exhibitions. And if they felt it was uh, significant work, then it could be moved into the museum and therefore into the culture. And that's how you would take an artwork and bring it into the culture. Bill, is this you in the <laughs> Yes. But this is a while ago. This is the last week. No, I mean, this is in 1971 or something like that. Uh, now, what artists did is they attempted to uh, dematerialize the art object. You know, the, um, and we'll talk about that a little maybe later if we get into it. But uh, in this performance is a body work. So rather than making something, that can be commodified and bought and sold and transferred, et cetera. 
it was a work in which the artist's body was used to make the work. Now, as I said, it does become a kind of object because there is a record of it, a documentation of it, a video, in this case, a videotape. And what it did was uh, looked at uh, the artist as uh, the body, as the subject and object of the artwork. And in this case, uh, this piece was called Breathe and I was sitting in front of a video camera and I would lean forward and breathe on the lens and it would fog the camera. And then I would lean back and it would clear it again. And I would keep doing that back and forth and back and forth until the time that the temperature of the lens met the temperature of my breath. So in which case I could no longer, I was no longer able to breathe on it without its clearing immediately and I could not sit back and forth. So at that point, uh, it was a kind of self-completing system that the, the piece was over. Um, Uh, another technique that artists use to um, circumvent the gallery system uh, was to present work outside the context of gallery and museum in the street. Uh, and this piece is from 70, I can't see, five, I think. And it was, uh, I was asked by the Institute for Art and Urban Resources, which then became PS1, to create something for this uh, series of uh, publications, uh, newsprint publications that were distributed all over downtown New York. Um, the location for this was at, uh, in, down by the Wall Street area, right in front of the original uh, World Trade Center, where there was an entrance to the commuter trains that went off onto New Jersey and upstate New York on the, on the Hudson. Um, and this took place for 45 minutes, you know, this, and every minute a photograph was taken. And I was, this was me, the artist standing there. And I was standing in opposition to the direction that the pedestrians were flowing. And my stance was such that I was looking at the people passing by who just glanced at me and kept going because they were on their way and seeing if there were anyone who wanted to remain behind. I didn't say anything or do anything. I was just, it was just a glance. Uh, and it was uh, for me to kind of uh, point out or um, think about what's happening at that point. At that point, the entire area of the financial district was just emptying out. It was people coming in through tunnels, et cetera, to the financial area working, earning money, investing, making lots of money, or not, <laughs> and then abandoning the place itself. So um, I obviously didn't take the photographs. It was, uh, photographs were by uh, an artist. I'm sorry, photographer Sandy Rubinowitz. Uh, this is uh, something that has more to do with the idea of surveillance and the gaze of the other. Now, at this point, I wanna just tell you a little anecdote because uh, people have brought classes to my studio uh, and one person in particular, Yun Ji Yu, who was a lovely artist, wonderful artist, uh, educator, et cetera. And she had brought classes there for several times. And one of the last times she brought classes, not the last time, but one of the last times she brought classes there, I thought of this anecdote. And after she heard it, she said, to me later that it really illuminated my work for her. So I'll tell it to you. When I was living in Brooklyn and I was four years old, uh, my mother, I had five siblings, five brothers. Well, I'm sorry, I had four brothers at that time. So uh, my mother was very busy as you can imagine. So at one point she wanted uh, my oldest brother to take all the younger brothers for a walk around the block. Well, I had not been used to going out that much because we were very limited in our, as four-year-olds are. I mean, I was walked from one place to another, but always with my mother. And um, I was very afraid, I got very scared. So she assured me 
that I would be fine because not only did I have my big brother there, but I also had a guardian angel. So her concept, I think our idea was to comfort me knowing that there was an angel watching me. I was freaked out about it, scared the bejesus out of it. So I think that may have led to or contributed to a kind of sense of the gaze of the other, um, a kind of paranoia. Uh, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not following you, but in any case, uh, and how the gaze of the other alters your behavior. And in society, how that happens, you know, out in the streets, in your businesses, in stores, wherever you go, you alter, you know, or shift your movement, your behavior, according to the eye that is in your brain, that's looking at your behavior, which you attribute to an authority of some sort. So this piece was called Ulterior Motives. I was invited to the Synapse. Um, uh, it was a video project at Syracuse University. And uh, they accepted my proposal for uh, a much more conventional piece than, than this, but they accepted this as well. It was called Ulterior Motives. And what I did was they put posters up around the campus and, and nearby in the neighborhood. And it said, if you see this man, call such and such a, a number that I had an ulterior motive for being there. And then at the end of the residency, they had a situation much like uh, the professor and I are here, where on the top there was a questionnaire, questioner and uh, interrogator, and on the bottom, I was locked in a room and they tried to get me to reveal what it was. During the week, I would leave different clues around to distract people or to divert people's attention from one thing or another. And <clears throat> so they never did discover what, it, what the ulterior, ulterior motive was. And in keeping with the idea of the piece, uh, I still haven't mentioned it to anyone about what the, the real ulterior motive was. So here you have the idea of the artist, the body work, the kind of attention, the surveillance of an individual moving around within an urban setting. This piece was uh, called Rumor and Innuendo at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Uh, and it kind of explored the museum as an, as an object or an ins the institution as an object. Uh, there were four surveillance cameras and four uh, audio speakers and microphones distributed in places, uh, the public areas of the Whitney Museum. So it was all live. There was no, there was one recording made for documentary purposes, but the piece doesn't really physically exist. It can be, I guess, uh, reconstructed, but actually it was reconstructed once in, in Indianapolis, but the idea here is uh, performance work that takes place and has that ephemeral quality to it of performance. So for this piece, there were 32 actors, I believe professional actors, who the museum gave press passes to so they could come in and out of the museum whenever they wanted. <clears throat> so what they would do is they would go to an area that was covered by the surveillance cameras and they would do a, 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 an action or, uh, based on their observation of what people would do in that area. So if you were passing by and somebody was sitting on this bench, you would notice that the outline or the parameters of the lens of the surveillance camera are, is outlined here. And the person might come and sit down and go through her purse and get up again and leave. And that could be what a normal person did visiting a museum or in this case, it would be um, the actors. So this is not actors, but just the pedestrians. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, visitors to the museum. 
Uh, there was also this part, which was a camera installed on a curator's desk, which is a semi-public place. Uh, and what happened was I had recruited a number of other artists who would send uh, the curator, Patterson Sims, uh, various pieces of uh, requests for looking at slides or, or letters or other things. And um, also his children, uh, this is a picture, but not of his children, they're my children, or one of my children, I should say. So some of this was real and some of this was not. In this work, it's called The Commuter. It was done in the Bronx. Um, and um, I have to apologize for the quality of some of these images like this because I haven't been out to my studio in many months. So I wasn't able to, I could only use the images that I had at, at hand on my computer. But suffice it, let's just go on from here. Uh, this is a map of the Bronx. Uh, Manhattan is down here and Westchester County is here. Um, it was called the commuter um, and the Metro North trains from Connecticut go through and the suburbs of uh, Connecticut and New York and they stop and pick up passengers. And then they hit the Bronx at a certain point and then they exit eight minutes later into Manhattan. At Fordham, they uh, can't, will discharge passengers, but they won't take anyone on. And again, when they get into Manhattan at 125th Street, they will discharge passengers, but won't take anyone on. <clears throat> These photographs, which unfortunately you can't see, um, are of the people on the, on the train itself. And I, in researching it, went down to meet this particular train, this particular train that went through from a little before eight till eight o'clock, eight, a little after eight, uh, eight minutes. Uh, and when the people were coming off the train itself, I was able to, and it was a very full train, hundreds of people. I was able to count the number of minorities on the train with one hand, fingers of one hand, less than six. So the it had a picture of who it is that in the morning and evening rush hours is on the train that passes through uh, these areas in the Bronx. So what I did is I took a kind of prototype, I became a kind of prototype of a commuter and I would arrive at a location uh, next to the tracks in the Bronx uh, in which people who lived in the neighborhood could see. Uh, and I stood there for the amount of time it took the train to move through and then left. Um, I'd have uh, a copy of that day's Wall Street Journal and kind of peruse it a little bit. I had my attache case, <clears throat> which included um, some <laughs> artifacts that allowed me to put some stuff in my hair and <laughs> put some stuff in my hair and then brush it back to look more like a, uh, like a Wall Street person. Now, I want to divert for a little bit to just say that one of the things that interests me in terms of um, surveillance when it comes to video is a pyramidal form, which has at the apex, the camera lens and at its base would be a trapezoid, which defines the parameters of what information is being taken in visual information taken into the camera. So when the people in the neighborhood are looking into the train, they can only see what's in very small train windows. So it's almost what the people in the train are looking out at the neighborhood. And from listening to conversations, making the people on the train who are speaking about where they are and what they're doing are making you know, comments about society and neighborhoods and who to blame for the devastation that occurs in the less affluent areas of the metropolitan area. Now here's an even worse image. <laughs> This is a leaflet uh, 
which uh, is titled um, A Pedestrian's Guide to Surveillance on the, in the Upper East Side Historic District. And it is, uh, you may have noticed in certain neighborhoods, there are the brown signs and they show you where you are and they mark out uh, an historic district. And this was done at the Sculpture Center in Manhattan, it, which is within this particular district. Now, you can see it's an extensive list, but this was back in 94, I believe. And of course, it just located all cameras directed at public areas, not just at the door that it was guarding, but also the sidewalk, et cetera. So you could be seen from any of these things, any of these areas. And if you went to the, into the gallery itself, there was a, a very large uh, exhibition space. Um, one time uh, a couple arrived at the gallery, opened the door and said, oh, they're not showing anything and left, <laughs> which is interesting. Uh, I consider that a success. The name of the piece uh, was called Something's in the Air. And this installation in the large first gallery that you come into is called Frames of Reference. So the cameras had uh, a very thick fishing line behind them, uh, which defined those pyramidal shapes I'm talking about. What areas of the gallery were seen by these cameras and the cameras covered the entire gallery with the exception of one small space over here on the side. And the gal of those lines, while they were attached to the walls and the ceiling, and behind the camera, they were loose where they hit the ground. So, and they had fishing weights on them. Also interestingly in pyramidal forms. So these lead pyramidal fishing weights would hold the, the line in place. But when you went through it, of course you may brush against it. And so the line would swing out of shape and then settle back in. There was a second room uh, which had an installation called a device for the detection and drawing of radio waves. So in the first gallery, we had the visual thing and here we have an audio thing, audio surveillance. There was a device that was hooked up to um, police radio calls in New York City. All of the precincts were being uh, monitored by this machine. And it was, it's uh, against the FCC regulations to broadcast that, to have that live, you cannot do that. So I had a machine which just drew, drew the picture, drew a line whenever a signal came through. Um, this is motivated by uh, the idea of attribution, uh, surveillance and attribution. I mean, we may see something happening and we may say, we draw conclusions and say, this is what's happening, this is what's going down, when it may or may not be true. So someone would call 911 and they get an operator and the operator would say, um, and they give a description of someone who is worthy of attention. And the operator would then in turn describe it to a police car, officers in a police car in the area, they would go around and they would look and see if they found anyone who matched that description. <clears throat> and, you know, it may or may not be true that that was the person because so many of us dress alike and look alike and we're not. And for the, um, I think it was a six week or five week exhibition, this drawing continued to accumulate. Um, this is uh, a piece, I'm just checking the time. I think we're gonna go through a little faster. This is a piece in Russia. Um, uh, it was a two room installation. In the first room, you would see a video monitor with this image coming on. It was a live image of me in the other space. In the second space, um, I was, uh, drawing by placing uh, rubbing graphite powder on the 
parameters that the lens was looking at, creating a trapezoid that would uh, fill the area. And it was a collaborative piece with the uh, Ukrainian uh, poet and painter Yuri Liederman. Uh, and in the gallery itself, there was this floor covered with paper. There were two very large speakers and Yuri's very resonant voice could be heard uh, reciting um, kind of a stream of consciousness poem. And the subject of the poem was uh, a, a childhood friends of his who had died from an overdose at the age of 19, came back to him in a dream, but was an automaton who was teaching art history to students, uh, I think he called them African students. And I was teaching art in the Bronx at the time and Yuri had visited me and noticed that the race of the people were mixed to say the least. And uh, he associated, he thought when we collaborated, it would be uh, reflective of that. Um, in the poem, it was structured around, uh, the, the language was structured in such a way that he would repeat a particular word, talk or etak, uh, as he was reciting the poem. And when he said the word talk, I would get up and, work, and act as if I were the uh, automaton uh, uh, in the guise of a surveillance camera. <clears throat> and I would move to a member of the audience and either act like uh, uh, as a, a, a pan movement or a zoom movement uh, with uh, the member of the audience. And then when he would say talk or re-talk again, I would then return to the gallery and, and uh, finish the drawing on the floor. The shape of the drawing on the floor is very much like this shape. Uh, uh, the professor was talking before about the, uh, the, the piece in the park. This is Madison Square Park. Um, it was called um, Madison Square Trapezoids. Um, and again, it included uh, three surveillance cameras directed at areas of the lawn, three lawns within the, within the park. Um, in addition to th th those images of this area uh, were transmitted to monitors in another part of the park. So if you were in the park and sat down uh, by the Shake Shack, actually it was in that restaurant, there were um, large monitors which would show what was going on within the parameters of, of that lens, that surveillance camera. <clears throat> and um, included in the title was Madison Square Trapezoids with performances by the Vigilant Groundsman. So I actually became, I mean, when I was first invited, I went to the park and I observed what was going on in the behavior. And it uh, was interesting to me how the workers were being treated. Um, not badly, but certainly being monitored and um, directed by people. Um, it gets very complicated, but uh, I thought, well, it's interesting. I'll, I'll become a park worker under observation. And there were performances based on uh, experience I had working with a botanist at the New York Botanical Garden on um, experiment, uh, documentation that they made of plants and animals in the New York Botanical Garden forest. Um, so the uh, performances took place every day. I was like an employee. I'd show up every well, five days a week for six hours a day and I would work in the park and I became part of the crew actually. The only difference was the way I was dressed uh, in the back of my jacket was called the vigil, uh, was named the vigilant uh, groundsman. And people came in through the park, you know, several tens of thousands of people walk through the park every day. And many of them started to notice what was happening over time. <coughs> It extended through October and you can see here, the areas of surveillance became more and more evident as time went on. 
the performances included maintaining the trapezio, which was moving all the leaves and anything that had fallen within the trapezio every day. Um, and there were performances outside um, based on botanical studies made in the forest and the, and the Bronx. Uh, one of them was the uh, frequency of squirrels in which I would sit here. I may have that slide. No, I don't have that slide. No, okay. I would sit uh, over here uh, with binoculars and I would write down the number of times the squirrels, the number of squirrels, they were, the park is filled with squirrels and people feed them like crazy. So they're always there. Not when this picture was taken, obviously. Um, so it's called the frequency of squirrels. There was another one called the girth of trees in which I measured the girth of all the trees in the park and where their location, distance, direction, etc. cetera. Uh, finally, we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, this is called the parachutist or non-combatant aesthete. It was done during the time of the, after, during and after the Iraq uh, war uh, at the time of Guantanamo. Uh, the uh, parish, parachutist and non-combatant non aesthete was addressed as a Guantanamo prisoner and the story behind the piece, uh, the fiction, the fantasy about it, is that uh, I was being flown from Kabul to Guantanamo and fell out of the plane and landed in the French Alps. And from there, I trekked to uh, a high place, uh, an abandoned 12th century castle, the ruins of it, in, uh, on the Rhone across from the uh, city of Valence. And I was looking for a place where I could not gain sanctuary, but be able to uh, make sure that Rumsfeld or Wolkowitz uh, or Cheney weren't following me. So this was the final part of the thing. So it was 63 kilometers walking through small French villages and towns, um, carrying a World War II parachute, binoculars, maps, etc. cetera. And um, I didn't stop or anything. I just kept going right through and people would notice me or not. There was one group of kindergarten children who stopped me and wanted to know if I, fell from the sky and uh, I said, yeah, I'm just looking for Crusol, the name of the castle, and they pointed me in the right direction. Um, not being satisfied with just being able to observe people coming for me, uh, the story went on and I decided to try, the parachutist decided to try and find sanctuary in the place of his origins. So I traveled to uh, Ireland, supposedly flew from France to Ireland, fell out of that plane onto the beaches there and walked um, a, a route of a thousand kilometers up to the ruins of my great-grandparents' farm in Roscommon, Dunham and Roscommon. Um, and again, it was like a long trek. This would be the end of the trek where I anticipate a crossing to uh, uh, Rotterdam. Because while I'm there, the story goes, I find out that my DNA actually uh, starts at the border between um, Austria and Italy, because my DNA is traced back to the Iceman, a 5,000 year old corpse that was frozen and found on the border there. And uh, my DNA only differs by two little pieces of the DNA uh, from his, so he's a direct descendant. That part was never realized. Um, but here you can see uh, on the back of the uh, jumpsuit is non-combatant aesthete. Uh, this is a piece called uh, Tai Chi Army. It, consists of uh, two, a little more than 2,000 toys, pl little plastic toy soldiers. Um, their weapons have been surgically removed. In this case, the rifles being held over their head. Um, and the 
concept there was to find an alternative uh, to what's going on, for example, in Ukraine at the moment, that uh, a silliness kind of thing that uh, as if enemies could be held off by the uh, self-defense, the martial art of self-defense being Tai Chi. Um, that goes in, along in exhibitions with the performance by the Tai Chi soldier, uh, this one in France, uh, and every day going out and practicing the Tai Chi form in public areas. Uh, this was for an exhibition at PS1 uh, it was group exhibition called um, Emergency Room. So every day you would do something for this exhibition. And this was a performance on Park Avenue of the same idea, dressed as a Tai Chi soldier. There is no such thing as a Tai Chi soldier, I assume. <clears throat> but I would go out into public and I would, I would do this, document it, bring it to the museum and hang it up. This is on Fifth Avenue. Uh, the next day. So let's go back to that one. I uh, also tried to do some of the performances in area, both in France and in New York in areas that related to the military. In this case, the statue of Sherman and at the, in Central Park, at the base of Central Park. So we have very few minutes. So I'm gonna to try to talk a little bit about this. Uh, as I said before, uh, visitors to the gallery can come in and pick up one or as many labels as they wish and take them and use them as, as they wish. They can post them in public areas or private areas, whatever. And as I said, it's just the idea here is that uh, the homeless are included with uh, priority seating uh, access. Now, surveillance comes into this because it's kind of reversing the roles uh, a little bit where the audience itself is being observed because there are a lot of surveillance cameras wherever you might want to put this. And technically it may be illegal because um, there is uh, on the back of this is a warning from the Department of Sanitation, as I mentioned earlier, saying that you're not allowed to really do this. So it becomes a performance in a way because when I'm doing this, I have to make sure that the surveillance cameras are not in sight or I have to do some sort of distraction so that people will not notice the fact that I'm, I'm doing it. Um, this is another participatory piece, but I'm not gonna get into that. This is an installation on a bus, a uh, New York City bus. And this is at 116th Street on the Lexington Avenue line with the label put in here. Um, and this, of course, if you're doing this sort of thing, don't worry about it because you have a guardian angel watching over you. Okay, so. Um, I'm sorry that we have, I wasn't able to, or weren't, we weren't able to meet in person uh, and have this more of a conversation, a discussion, as opposed to kind of a, a lecture thing. But I appreciate uh, the opportunity and I thank you, Midori, for uh, allowing me this, this time. Can I ask you a question? Yes, please. So earlier in your talk, you said, you were circumventing the gallery system. You you avoided the gallery system. Why did you not want to be part of the gallery system? Hmm. <laughs> well, it's not you can't avoid it totally because if your work is recognized, then people want to exhibit it. So, the work itself perhaps doesn't take place. It's very rare that I do a piece that's a performance of mine in a, in, in a gallery, it, it's possible and it's been done, but um, originally there are two motivations for avoiding the gallery system. One was a response to the uh, commodification of the art object. And um, 
Julian Schnabel and people in the in his venue are were creating works opposed to this stance, opposed to intellectualism, conceptualism, minimalism. And of course, these were the areas that, they, that were important to me. Um, another reason is a response to a political thing that street performances, walk, working in, in the street was to, uh, to bring to people the art object without the baggage, if you will, of the art context. When you walk into a museum or a gallery and say, I'm going to see art and I'm in the art context and I know what it is and I'm attaching meaning to it through my experiences in art, my knowledge of art, my appreciation of art, my experience with art prior to that. In the street performance, it's uh, a more direct link because it's a, an indication, a direction. Um, there's someone who said that the role of the artist is not to lead, but to direct and direct attention to a particular thing. Um, this was pioneered by uh, this uh, group in, there are many groups with one um, actual or action in Czechoslovakia under the communist rule there that it was uh, art was being suppressed. The only art being supported was uh, socialist kind of art. And so artists, not just artists, even dentists and doctors and people would do things in the street. Uh, they would either collect some strange objects and out of context and put them somewhere. So if you're walking down the street, you say, hmm, well, that's interesting. What is that? It's out of context a little bit. So you can only look at it as the only way you can make logic out of it is it must be a piece of art. Also performances in the street um, uh, the people would do, like in Czechoslovakia, there was one in which uh, there were directions by an artist to, uh, for a number of people to be blindfolded and lie down in the street for a period of time. Now, the symbolism or the meaning of that is brought to it, not just by the artist, but by the audience. What can this mean? What can this possibly mean? So outside the gallery system, you can create works which are more directly uh, involving um, a broader audience. Thank you. I, I was also very much astounded about the surveillance system, which seems like it's creating its own like artwork. And when you start recognizing the surveillance system, there's entirely different type of like space and uh, things start appearing. So I really appreciate it. Yes, I mean, it's almost like a, a piece of sculpture. It's like a misshapen kind of pyramid that you walk in and through and around. And if you become aware of it, um, you could almost, you know, it can almost direct you <laughs> to avoid it or to ignore it. But it's a, to me, it's a very interesting uh, form. Yeah, it's, it's always there, but you can actually not to see it unless you pay extra attention. Yes. And it was very interesting how we cohabit with this kind of like space and the um, recording system that yes. sound recording was also very amazing. I did a talk at the yeah, yeah I did a talk at the Whitney Museum when I had a piece there and it involved surveillance and um, someone in the audience was extremely upset that I use that as a subject. Um, but as she walked out of the gallery and into the museum, she was seen by three surveillance cameras without her knowledge. So it was trying to bring attention to this kind of situation and attribution. You know, if uh, when I worked in the Bronx, people would attribute uh, behavior to a certain thing. 
if there was an exchange of money for a small package, it was assumed to be drugs. But it could have been a Bible salesman. We know it doesn't necessarily. So those kind of things uh, interested me. Like conventional ideas, conventional yes. ideas. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much, Bill. And this is going to be recorded. It was recorded and it will be posted. So when I get some like feedback from um, students, I will I will forward it to you. So thank you.